Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, my name is Ben Bruflat, and this lecture is being completed in partial fulfillment for my Doctorate of Music Arts candidacy. Today, we're going to be talking about Dmitry Sostakovich and his Piano Concerto Number no. 1, which was written in 1933. Uh, Brass players are very familiar with Shostakovich's writing as his symphonies frequently featured uh, very prominent brass lines. However, despite his love of brass lines, uh, Shostakovich never wrote any type of feature for a brass instrument. All of his concertos composed were either for piano, a string instrument, or I believe a bassoon. Uh, however, this is the closest we got to a real trumpet concerto because it actually started out as a trumpet concerto, and we'll talk more about the history of that as we get to it. Um, I'm going to start out by talking to you guys about the background of Dmitry Shostakovich and his musical upbringing and his musical output through 1933 when this piece was written. I'll talk about his relationship with the Soviet Union and the heavy censorship that was going on in that time. And then we'll actually analyze the piano concerto number one itself, talk about the role of the trumpet, uh, cover two of the major excerpts that come from this piece and some performance tips for it. And then uh, we'll discuss the legacy of Shostakovich's piano concerto and what it means not only to the trumpet world, but to the music community as a whole. So without further ado, let's get started. Dmitry Shostakovich was born in 1906 to a very musical family. Uh, his mother and his older sister actually both play piano. Uh, his mother was the teacher of his older sister. Uh, and in addition to having piano music happening all the time in the household, uh, Dmitry's father uh, would often sing folk tunes around the house. Uh, Despite the fact that there was a lot of music happening in the house, Dmitry Shostakovich did not initially want to be a musician. It wasn't until 1915 where he finally caught the itch to study music. And he when he discovered uh, his love in attendance for an opera by uh, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov called The Tale of Tsar Sultan. Uh, when Dmitri attended this event, he immediately fell in love with the craft and began studying piano. And even though he started a little late, starting when he was only nine years old, he advanced very quickly and he eventually enrolled in the Petrograd Conservatory in 1919 with Maximilian Steinberg, who just so happened to be the son-in-law of one Rimsky-Korsakov. So right off the bat, Shostakovich had a direct connection to the man who inspired him to be a musician in the first place. Now, Shostakovich had a very interesting relationship with Steinberg and the conservatory. Of course, during his time of study, he was very respectful of all of their teachings. Uh, however, later in life, when he had a little bit more clout, he uh, criticized the conservatory the conservatory as a whole, as well as Maximilian Steinberg, for being very short-sighted and sticking with conventions. Uh, Shostakovich wanted to pursue more of an avant-garde style of writing, and that just did not go with what the conservatory taught at that time, leading to Shostakovich to later criticize their inability to adapt to the world in his eyes. Nevertheless, he graduated in 1926 with his uh, first major composition being the final project of his studies. Uh, this was Symphony No. 1. Uh, and after Symphony No. 1 premiered, it immediately shot Dmitry Shostakovich into international fame. Um, it was a very, very much an overnight success upon the premiere of this symphony, and it led to uh, Shostakovich having a lot of composition opportunities, which he would pursue very heavily, especially a year after he graduated, uh, because he, he uh, entered a piano competition in 1927, because remember, he started as a pianist, um, 
but he did not place very highly in this competition. So he decided to shift his focus to be almost exclusively, but very much so primarily as a composer who also plays piano. Um, after this uh, symphony though, he, he had a lot of compositions up until 1933, including uh, two more symphonies, two operas, a ballet, and I think four or five film scores. So there was never a dull moment when it came to him as a musician. Now, here's the interesting part about Shostakovich that is almost impossible to uh, not bring up when Dmitry Shostakovich comes up as a subject. His relationship with the Soviet Union is often a necessity to discuss. And there's a lot of discussion, of course, today as to where Shostakovich's alliance truly laid. Um, most people are uh, in agreement that he was likely uh, only doing things uh, that the censors required out of out of their requirements. He did not actually uh, agree with the ideals of the Soviet Union. But again, that's a point of contention that's worth bringing up. Um, all that being said, uh, even though Dmitry himself had a very heavy involvement with politics, his family was very political as well. Uh, a fun fact is Dmitry Shostakovich's grandfather was arrested as being an accomplice to Dmitry Karakasov's attempt on Alexander II's life. Uh, so his grandfather was a convicted criminal for helping attempt murder of the monarchy. Um, in addition to that, his parents were very vocally supportive of the uh, Soviet revolutions in 1917 that led to the fall of the monarchy and the installation of the uh, socialist regime. Uh, Shostakovich himself in his music had a lot of involvement when it came to uh, pol political climate, uh, there was a lot of negative buzz around the premiere of his first opera called The Nose. Uh, the Nose was written in 1928 and uh, it was produced in 1930 for its debut performance. Um, and at, at this time, this was after Shostakovich had graduated from the conservatory where he finally had a little bit more freedom to write in the avant-garde styles that he really enjoyed. Um, one particular influence of his writings at this time was Alban Berg and Berg's uh, opera called Wozzeck, um, which is very influential in the composition of the notes. Uh, naturally, the general audience did not take too kindly to the notes, although there were musicians uh, and music students and theorists who appreciated the nose for its contribution to the ever-changing landscape of music, because of the public negative uh, reception, Shostakovich was kind of put on thin ice in terms of his standing with the government at the time. Um, Shostakovich also wrote a lot of film scores. Uh, he wrote a handful before his composition of the first piano concerto, but he also wrote at least a dozen more afterwards as well. Uh, film music was a very big part of his uh, compositional output because regardless of the meaning behind the films, he needed the money because his father passed away in 1922 and he needed to support his family. So even though the music was for propaganda films, he took the gigs anyway so that he could put bread on the table. Um, and there are a lot of contradictions involving his, his stance on film music and other music. Um, there, are, there are frequent contradictions between Shostakovich's words and his actions. Of course, later in life, uh, he talked about how he regretted working on propaganda films, but he also enjoyed the opportunity to do so, not only for the money, but because the propaganda films that came out during the Soviet Union and their heavy censorship, uh, they had very simplistic plots and that allowed Shostakovich to write in almost a sarcastic manner. He was a very sarcastic man. 
so he enjoyed being able to write in this style uh, and it also helped teach him about more of the conventional popular styles of the 20s and 30s that would play into his piano concerto. Um, but in addition to uh, that contradiction, he also publicly denounced jazz music in 1930, calling it a low art. And then four years later, went on to write a piece that's titled The First Jazz Suite. So a lot of contradictions between what he says and what he does. And that's what leads to people wondering where his alliances truly were. Um, several of the pieces that Shostakovich wrote were intentionally unreleased until a lot later in his life. Uh, specifically his uh, first violin concerto and his fourth string quartet uh, were held from release until after the death of Joseph Stalin in the 1950s. Uh, I believe both of those pieces that I just mentioned premiered it literally months after the death of Stalin. So he, he was holding on to them for a reason. Uh, specifically with string quartet number four, there are a lot of Jewish themes in the melodies and that would naturally not have been accepted very widely in the time. Um, Shostakovich, like I said, was on thin ice after the nose and although he was working in propaganda films and you know doing things to bolster up his reputation, uh, he was finally publicly denounced in 1936. Joseph Stalin attended a performance of his opera, Lady Macbeth of the Mitzent, the Mitzentsk district. I am sorry, words are hard. Uh, that is a Russian word that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, but regardless, Stalin did not like this Lady Macbeth opera at all. And he was so visually disgusted with it that the next day in the propaganda newspapers, uh, there were articles condemning the opera and Shostakovich himself. And so there was a lot of tension in Shostakovich's life, to say the least, when it came to the political climate. Um, so that's a little bit of his background as a musician and as a human being uh, leading up to the composition of his first piano concerto. Now let's actually look at the piece itself. Uh, piano Concerto Number no. 1 was composed in 1933, and it actually started as a project for a trumpet concerto. Um, sources say that Shostakovich sat down to write a trumpet concerto, and then it evolved into a double concerto with trumpet and piano, and then it evolved further from that into what he called piano concerto that just happened to feature a solo trumpet as well. It was very reflective of the composer's film scoring. Like I said, Shostakovich got to do a lot of writing for propaganda, meaning he got to learn a lot about the popular uh, genres of movies and you know, the types of music that would play at other public events like a circus and stuff like that. Um, so those elements are all over this piano concerto in terms of its emotional contrast uh, throughout. Uh, this piece premiered on October 15th of 1933 with Shostakovich himself on the piano. Although he did abandon being a full-time concert pianist, he was still a very gifted musician and uh, frequently performed his own pieces, and this was no exception. Um, and it was actually very well received, and it helped boost uh, Shostakovich's reputation once more within the Soviet Union. Um, the orchestration is very simple. It's just for piano, trumpet, and strings. No woodwinds, no other brass, no percussion. Uh, a typical performance is four movements with 21 to 25 minutes. I could not find any recordings that were shorter or longer. Um, now let's talk about each individual movement. We'll talk a little bit about the forms, about the themes that are presented, and then uh, we'll finally look at the trumpet's involvement in the process. Movement one is labeled as an allegro moderato. It is a typical sonata allegro form with a, an exposition development recapitulation. Um, and this is where we see how Shostakovich really likes to quote people. Um, throughout the entire piece, there are quotations all over the place, uh, but we get one right away. Um, Shostakovich was obviously a student of the music of Beethoven and there are several Beethoven quotes throughout this piece. We'll look at one more later. Uh, 
but the main theme itself right away is very reminiscent of Beethoven's Piano Sonata number 23, which is known as the Appassionata Sonata. Um, there's a, a descending minor triad with a dotted rhythm that is um, that a lot of people think it's, it's too coincidental to be an accident. It's probably a, an homage to Beethoven himself. So let's listen to the piano of Shostakovich's concerto, introduce the theme, and then we'll listen to the Beethoven theme, and you'll be able to hopefully hear the similarities. The first notes you heard were those descending minor triad notes. Now here's Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. Like I said, probably too much of a coincidence to be an accident. So that's the main theme that exists in the exposition and the recapitulation. Now the development section picks up the pace. We have this very slow and, and uh, emotional opening to the piece, but the development section itself is very frantic and it features multiple different new ideas. Uh, the piano introduces a new idea and then the trumpet finally comes in with its first contribution of any notes and uh, presents another theme. So let's listen to those two ideas now. That's how the development section begins. And uh, later on, we have a trumpet line introduce another idea. Now, once both of those ideas have been presented, they are played interchangeably between all of the instruments, the piano, trumpet, and strings. Um, and the development section takes up a lot of the time of this movement. Um, we almost get back to a recapitulation. The string section actually teases a return uh, to the main theme by playing the opening melody of the piano before the piano quickly interrupts them and continues this uh, up-tempo development section. And then finally, the ending of the piece uh, actually starts to happen with the piano playing the main theme. It's almost identical to how the piece began, only now we have the trumpet line uh, underneath the piano sustaining very long and low notes. So let's listen to how movement one concludes. It ends as subtly as it begins, very quietly, very slowly. And that actually plays into the transition to the second movement, the Lento movement. As, as is the tradition of pieces that have four movements, the second movement is often the slowest one, and this is no exception to that rule. We have a slow waltz that has uh, been labeled by scholars as being ABA prime in form. Uh, and these sections are separated with uh, very specific expression markings. Uh, 
um, performers who have the music know that a piomoso leads into an appassionato, and that's when we are truly in the B section uh, before a largo indicates that we transition back to A with the A prime. Now the trumpet player in the first movement had a very limited role, very much in the supporting role. Uh, however, in movement two, we see Shostakovich's first inclusion of the trumpet as a real solo instrument. Uh, after the B section, when A prime returns, um, we're introduced to the main melody from A, uh, and it's played on a muted trumpet as a trumpet solo. So let's listen to the trumpet solo in the second movement. Now we'll talk more about uh, that solo later on when we look at the excerpts from this piece, but that's the first indication that this used to be some sort of trumpet piece that has been remodified to be a piano piece that features trumpet. Uh, the lento movement of this piece is overall a lot darker in terms of the emotion than the other movements. The first movement, while it starts slow, it does have that major key upbeat middle section and then of course the finale is very up tempo and hectic um, the lento offers almost a sort of anger or mourning uh, thanks to the use of a lot of repeated notes a lot of diminished chords and a really wide contrast of dynamics the next section i want to play comes from the b section and it's the written peak of this movement where the solo piano plays a, a triple forte line and you'll hear the anguish in the music thanks to the repetition of the low left hand notes as we decrescendo back into nothingness and this is what leads into the A prime section. So yeah, that's, it's very, very dark, very, very much a sense of turmoil. And that, that uh, extreme emotion contrast really uh, helps separate this piece from a lot of others at the time, I believe. But let's move into the last two movements. Now I limp them together in one slide because occasionally movements three and four are labeled as one movement label uh if if they are played as one movement they are labeled as moderato dash allegro con brio moderato being the title of the third movement and allegro con brio being the fourth um this is often done not only because there is an ataka that leads from the third movement directly into the final movement but it's also because the third movement is very very short it's usually performed in less than two minutes because there are only 44 measures um, and because of the fact that the third movement and fourth movement are so connected, uh, thanks to the Ataka, uh, 
It's really hard to label a form for this part of the piece. One scholar I found labeled it as a modified rondo form with the different variations of the melody being played in the piano throughout. Uh, but that's just one way of looking at it. All of this to say, uh, there's a lot going on here and uh, it can be difficult to apply these sorts of labels. Um, but in the final movement, in the fourth movement, uh, we have even more quotations from Shostakovich to other pieces. I do not have time to cover all of them because I, I found a lot of different ideas in a couple of different dissertations I read where uh, somebody says that he quotes Barber of Seville, somebody said he quotes Stravinsky, but I just wanted to highlight one piano quote and one trumpet quote. Uh, the trumpet quote is very on the nose and obvious, while the piano quote uh, has a little bit more subtlety to it. Um, in, the, in the hectic uh, pace of the final movement, the trumpet suddenly interrupts everything else to play a quotation of Haydn's piano sonata in D major. Um, and it should be fairly obvious when we listen to both of them back to back. So here is the trumpet line in Shostakovich. That kind of comes out of nowhere. And then we here's the Haydn line itself. And it, this one should be uh, pretty easy to identify. Later on, when we get to the final cadenza played by the piano, uh, near the beginning of the cadenza, there's a quotation of Beethoven yet again, uh, where we have an ascending line that is reminiscent of Beethoven's Rage Over a Lost Penny, another piano piece. Um, this one is a lot harder to identify because it's played in the left hand while the melody is happening in the right hand. Uh, so I'm going to play Beethoven's quote first, and then hopefully you'll be able to hear it in the left hand as it moves by very quickly, but it's definitely there. So here's Beethoven's quote first. And here is the Shostakovich uh, cadenza. Yeah, it happened very quickly there. It was, I'm gonna play that one for you one more time. It should happen in the first few seconds. Really pay close attention to that left hand as subtle as it is. Oopsies. Yeah. Very subtle, um, but of course this all goes to point out the fact that Shostakovich was, of course, a piano player himself, so a lot of the music he was playing as a student naturally made its way into his compositions, and it made it very easy for him to quote. Maybe he did it as a way to, uh, to pay respect to the composers of the music that he studied while in school. Uh, but regardless, the piece is littered with uh, all of these quotations. Um, the final movement is very hectic like this. Um, the only point that is not as crazy is a, a very out of left field trumpet solo where everything kind of grinds to a halt. And we'll talk more about that uh, at the end. But after this trumpet solo, the, they go into the piano cadenza and then end the piece with uh, a lot of flourish. So let's talk about the role of the trumpet now. Uh, the trumpet has a very limited supporting role in the first movement. Um, we, I, I played where you, you get to hear the trumpet introduce one of the themes, one of the multiple themes that are played in the development section of the opening movement. Uh, so it seems that the trumpet's not gonna have a big role However, in the very opening lines of the piece, we kind of get a hint that there might be an important role for the trumpet uh, because the opening couple measures of the piece is just piano and trumpet uh, 
uh, as an introduction before the piano goes into its main melody of the exposition. Let's listen to that opening few measures. That's how the entire piece begins. So as a piano concerto, already featuring the trumpet in uh, to coincide with the piano part, kind of gives us an idea of, okay, this is not gonna be a typical, piano, uh, typical trumpet part. And uh, we finally see it have an important role in the second movement when it uh, opens up the A prime section with that muted trumpet solo. Uh, that's the first major contribution the trumpet makes to this uh, concerto. Of course, it is uh, completely tacit in the third movement, which is not to say much, because again, it's only 44 measures long, a couple minutes, not a lot of uh, wiggle room to allow the trumpet any sort of prominence. But then the trumpet gives its most important contribution, in my opinion, to the piece in the final movement. There's a lot of back and forth between the trumpet and piano throughout this movement where they're almost interrupting each other. Uh, the Haydn quote that the trumpet introduces kind of comes out of nowhere and then is quickly interrupted by the piano continuing on, almost as if to, to try to distract the pianist with a familiar melody and throw it off track. Uh, like I said earlier, Shostakovich was a very sarcastic writer, so he, he understood the humor of these moments, and he really understood the humor in what he was doing when he wrote a, an out-of-left-field trumpet solo where everything grinds to a halt and suddenly the trumpet is playing a very simple melody that's actually based on a, a nursery rhyme uh, called either Poor Jenny or Poor Mary, depending on the translation. Uh, and then during this, this trumpet line, it, it's, there, there's a, a, a repeated sound effect being produced by the string instruments where they're just tapping their bow on their instrument. Uh, a lot of people think this was uh, a, a way for Shostakovich to poke fun at the Soviet censorship of the time and kind of appease what they were wanting music to sound like in the Soviet Union. Uh, but I've talked about it enough. Let's listen to this uh, sarcastic, humorous trumpet solo. <laughs> As you hear at the very end of that, the trumpet uh, ends the solo by accelerating back into the frantic pace that the rest of the movement had been at, as if to say that it, it was done interrupting the show for its showcase, and now we can carry on. Um, as I said, the trumpet and piano have a lot of conversation in this final movement, and this leads all the way into the finale of the piece. Uh, one would think that the piano cadenza would lead into a finale in which the piano is the prominent figure. However, the trumpet decides to uh, continuously interject with the pianist. And uh, ultimately, the trumpet gets the final word in the piece in a piano concerto. Uh, let's listen to the last few seconds of the the entire piece where you can hear the trumpet get the final say. <laughs> <laughs> 
and that's the end. Um, it's very, very unique that the piano is not the one to get the final say in its own concerto, but that just shows how important the role of the trumpet was to Shostakovich at the time which he sat down to write down what was originally a trumpet concerto. Although he ultimately abandoned that and wrote this as a piano concerto, he maintained the integrity of a trumpet line and still offered us as trumpet players and brass players something to enjoy as the closest thing we would ever get to a Shostakovich trumpet concerto by the composer himself. So there's a lot going on in that piece, but all of this is to say that although it is labeled as a piano concerto, the trumpet plays an important role. Now let's go cover a couple of those excerpts and talk about some important things to keep in mind for a performer who is practicing them. And the first excerpt is of course the muted solo in movement two. The, the piece does not specify what type of mute is used. It just says consort, which means with mute. Uh, typical practice for trumpet players is to play this with a cup mute. Um, and obviously playing any sort of music on a trumpet with a mute requires a good ear for intonation. So uh, performers should be very aware of that when they approach a piece like this. And although it's not a very technically demanding uh, excerpt, there's a lot of expression involved. Naturally, you want to incorporate vibrato where appropriate and phrase things in a way that makes sense for the style and the slowness of this excerpt. But an, under, a, an underrated aspect of this excerpt is how big of a range it really has. If you look here in the second line, we go all the way down to a low F sharp, which is one of the lowest natural notes that one can play on a trumpet. So playing a low F sharp muted in tune and at a piano dynamic is very difficult. And it goes all the way up to a high G sharp. Being aware of the range demands of this excerpt is important. And we also have to maintain the piano dynamic regardless of the register of the horn. So although the contour of the line rises and we can increase the dynamics ever so slightly, this never becomes a loud and boisterous solo. It's very contained, very limited. So these are just a few things to keep in mind for trumpet players who are learning this, this excerpt. It is deceptively difficult. Uh, what's not deceptively difficult is the excerpt from the final movement where the trumpet stops everything in its tracks. Right off the bat, it's apparent that we're going to be in a very difficult key. We have a 5-1 motion as we heard, bum, 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 which means we are playing this excerpt in the key of G flat, a very unfamiliar key for trumpet players typically. So being able to having the facility to play in a challenging key is important. Um, but the most important aspect of this excerpt, in my opinion, is nailing the style demands. Uh, it's very easy to over exaggerate uh, the articulation markings that are, <laughs> are written throughout here. Uh, we don't want to sound so short that we ultimately sound pecky on any of these staccato notes. We don't want it to come out dun da, di, 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 di. We don't want it to sound like that, but we also, of course, don't want it to sound very smooth and legato like the excerpt from Movement 2 as well. Um, so finding that perfect balance of articulation that, that bolsters the humor of this excerpt is really important. Also worth noting is where the accent markings are located. While the initial downbeat is accented, a lot of these measures have accents, this whole thing being in the two, four time signature, a lot of accents are on the and of one. We're not playing bum, 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 bum. We don't want it to sound like that. We want to put the emphasis on where Shostakovich wrote his accents. 
He was clearly very particular in how he wrote this, as is apparent throughout this entire excerpt. Bum 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 bum. We really want to lean into the notes that need to be leaned into. And of course, the technically demanding portion of this excerpt it takes place in the third line when we get to what's labeled as an ad lib. Uh, this section of the piece can be taken entirely out of time as it's only the trumpet playing. Uh, at this point, the strings stop tapping their bows on their instruments and we're able to uh, play more expressively. Now the recording we listened to when we listened to this excerpt, it played it at a very conservative pace. Uh, I've heard recordings of this really fly through uh, all of these all of these notes, but uh, what's important is maintaining control. However, whatever speed you take, you don't want the music to get away from you. And then it's also important to understand that once you get to rehearsal number 64, where the strings have a few more notes, and then of course, when we have this pickup, we are right back into a locked in tempo. It's very easy for this excerpt to rush because the rest of the movement has been in such a hurry. Uh, so taking your time throughout this excerpt is really important. Uh, it goes without saying that there's a lot more going on from an analytical standpoint of this excerpt compared to the previous excerpt. They each have their own challenges uh, and which are unique from each other, which is why these excerpts are frequently called in auditions. Um, this is also a popular piece that is performed, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, so it's important for trumpet players to be able to play both of these passages with accuracy and with ease. Finally, the last things I want to talk about today are is the legacy of Shostakovich's Piano Concerto Number no. 1 and how it has evolved over time and actually been rewritten as a trumpet concerto. And this rewrite was done by none other than Timothy Dokshitzer. Dokshitzer is perhaps one of the most impactful trumpet players in the world of the 20th century, by far the most impactful trumpet player in the Soviet Union during that time. He was born in Ukraine territory. Uh, he ultimately earned a degree from the Moscow Conservatory. Uh, and he was frequently the trumpet player on a lot of premieres of new works. Dokshitzer participated in a lot of uh, commissions, and he also inspired a lot of composers because he was such a, a phenomenal musician that uh, composers would ask him to premiere their pieces. Uh, some of the pieces that Dokshitzer premiered himself was the, uh, the concerto by Alexander Artunian, for which Dokshitzer actually wrote the famous cadenza that is still played today. Uh, the Tamburg Concerto was a premiere by Dokshitzer. And then the Weinberg Concerto was actually written for Dokshitzer, and he premiered it as well. Those are just a few examples, but he had a very, very big contribution in advancing solo trumpet literature in the latter half of the 20th century. Now, Dokshitzer, as prominent of a performer as he was, his relationship with Shostakovich was very brief. Uh, in in Dokshitzer's memoirs, he states that he would run into Shostakovich at uh, music events and other social gatherings. Um, and they would always talk about the fact that Shostakovich hasn't written a trumpet concerto yet. And Dokshitzer would, would bring it up. Hey, when are you going to write that trumpet concerto? And Shostakovich would always say, I'll get to it eventually. I'm, it's on my list of things to do. It ultimately never happened, uh, despite the fact that Dokshitzer did have uh, significant contributions to Shostakovich's music. He was actually the principal trumpet player on Shostakovich's 7th and 11th symphonies. So they were definitely not strangers, uh, but they never formally sat down and worked together to create a concerto. And uh, Dokshitzer uh, in his memoir states that one of his greatest regrets is not pursuing this harder as Shostakovich was his favorite composer. 
Um, ultimately, after Shostakovich's passing, Doc Schitzer took it upon himself and uh, as a way to honor his favorite composer, he arranged Shostakovich's piano concerto as a trumpet concerto. The instrumentation that Doc Schitzer used is identical to Shostakovich. It's still trumpet, piano, and strings, but he rewrote the melody lines to be played on the trumpet. Of course, the piano still has some of the melodies as the trumpet has some melodies in the piano concerto, uh, but it's ultimately retooled as a trumpet feature that also happens to have solo piano lines. This was uh, recorded multiple times in the 90s. Uh, the first appearance of this Dokshitzer arrangement of the Shostakovich was on the 1998 album Russian Treasures, which was an al album produced by the International Trumpet Guild. Let's listen to two excerpts of the Dokshitzer arrangement. I have the opening of the first movement and the final movement just to showcase uh, how Doc Schitzer rewrote the music. So here's the first movement. And now here is the final movement with Doc Schitzer in the lead role. So as you can see, Doc Schitzer had the technical prowess to perform such a virtuosic piece as a trumpet concerto while still maintaining the integrity of the music and allowing the piano to keep some of its important lines. Uh, maybe he left some of it the way it was because it was too difficult, who's to say? But this uh, recording is the only recording that has been released as of this lecture date of any sort of trumpet arrangement of Shostakovich's concerto. That being said, there is another one on the way. Enter Paul Merkello. Paul Merkello has been the principal trumpet for the Montreal Symphony since 1995. Um, he's an international performer. He plays with all, a bunch of different ensembles and conductors. Um, as of this uh, lecture date, he has recorded and released four CDs, which are all very highly acclaimed, and they they vary greatly in style as well. His first album is for trumpet and piano, and his two latest albums are for trumpet and orchestra. Uh, he can play in a variety of styles, um, as proven on these albums. In addition to being a frequent performer, uh, Mr. Markello also advocates for the aspirations of young brass players through a Paul Markello scholarship to fund these young musicians. Um, I was fortunate enough to discuss this piece with Paul Markello. We had an interview conducted over Instagram Live, and uh, Mr. Markello talked about how he has an upcoming album in which he has rewritten the Doc Schitzer arrangement of the Shostakovich Piano Concerto. Um, according to Mr. Markello, uh, Doc Schitzer's Russian Treasures was uh, a major inspiration to him, but there was no publication of the music of this full orchestration with trumpet piano strings. The only publication that existed of the Doc Schitzer rearrangement was a trumpet part with a piano reduction. 
So what Mr. Markello had to do with uh, help from some of his colleagues was purchase that reduction and reorchestrate it and fix any editorial mistakes. And uh, this has become a, a new project that was recorded this past year. So uh, Paul Markello has recorded the Dokshitzer arrangement of the Shostakovich concerto as reorchestrated to be uh, a full new performance. Um, this is actually an album that'll be coming out hopefully soon. Uh, as Mr. Markello told me, it's an album that is a way to honor uh, Mr. Dokshitzer because it has, uh, not only does it feature the Shostakovich piano concerto, but it features the Artunian, like I said before, uh, Doc Schitzer wrote the uh, cadenza for the Artunian concerto, and it uh, features the Weinberg concerto, which was written for Shostakovich. And funnily enough, uh, the widow Weinberg was present at Mr. Markello's recordings and was able to give feedback. Um, all of this is to say that the legacy of Shostakovich's Piano Concerto Number no. 1 is very important for trumpet players, and it's important enough for multiple people to take that piece and rewrite it. Uh, two people of Ukrainian descent between Dokshitzer and Paul Merkello, uh, who just want to show their appreciation for the, the music that is Shostakovich. And that's not the only legacy the piece has. Of course, it's important in trumpet circles for its excerpts being called on orchestral auditions and for these two arrangements of the piano concerto. But there's also the fact that over 40 recordings exist of the piano concerto itself. It's a very popular piece. And that's just like, that's just the recordings. If there are 40 recordings that just illustrates how frequently this piece has been performed since it premiered in 1933. And looking at the piece offers a lot of historical context, not only for Shostakovich's career and where it was at that time, but also as a way to look at how composers had to appease the Soviet censors while still being creative. So there's a lot of significance to this piece overall. You know, October 15th, 1933, it premieres. And then, you know, near oh, nearly 60 years later, I was born to give this presentation on a piece that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, that is all I have on this presentation. Here are my sources. The uh, audio that we listened to from the uh, piano concerto was a performance with Martha Argerich on piano and David Guerrero on trumpet. Um, played with the Festival Chamber Orchestra of Verbeer. Um, and that is all I have to say. So thank you all very much for being here.